obviously this class is covering man, sin, salvation. We, we finished up our primary discussion of the doctrine of man. Uh, we've entered into the uh, doctrine of sin. We're going to come back and uh, look at Genesis 3. I'll also make a few comments on Romans 5. Those appear to be, obviously there's a lot of passages dealing with the sin issue. But uh, Genesis 3, clearly you're dealing with the origin of uh, sin and its impact uh, in the world. Romans 5 is telling you directly uh, the impact of uh, Adam upon all of us. And then some comparisons with uh, Christ when it comes to uh, what Christ has done for us uh, in, regard to just, in, in regard to justification. So, uh, yeah, remember as we're studying the doctrine of sin, uh, this is more than just touching base on a category of systematic theology. Uh, we're covering a big part of the Christian worldview. So, you know, as we discuss Christ, uh, God's plans with an unbelieving world, you know, we talked about the fact that it's good to touch on the major parts of the Christian worldview, you know, creation and its implications, the fall, which obviously is going to deal, intersect with the doctrine of sin. And then, of course, uh, salvation and redemption in Christ. And then, of course, the, uh, the restoration of all things that is coming. Uh, one of the helpful things about being able to explain the doctrine of sin is that we're, this is uh, our chance to be able to convey to people what the problem is. Uh, it's been noted when you look at most of, most of the major religions and philosophies, they all uh, acknowledge that something's not right. There's something that's gone wrong. There's something that needs to be fixed. Uh, but it's Christianity that's able to actually explain uh, what went wrong. And so Genesis 3, obviously, is going to be very key for that. The, of course, a little bit of the background for the Genesis 3 is the, uh, the Genesis 2, 15 to 17. Then the Lord... God took the man, put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. So there's the statement that if they were to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they would perish. And then when you come to Genesis chapter three, this is where you have the introduction of sin Uh, Genesis chapter three, verse one says, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Of course, there's all kinds of implications just from Genesis chapter three, verse one. And some of the issues perhaps go beyond specifically what we're covering in theology three, particularly when you get into a angelology and dealing with the uh, Satan and the origins of his fall and all that. But there appears to be a dark force that enters the scene here. Um, This is identified as a serpent, so I think that we're dealing with a literal serpent here. I think because of the nature of what is going on here and because of what later Revelation will tell us, that this is more than just a uh, animal creature. This is actually, this is more than just a serpent. There's actually a power here uh, behind the serpent. So a serpent is being used, and yet there's a power uh, behind the serpent as well. So the serpent comes on the scene. This appears to be uh, the entrance of of Satan into this encounter. I think I mentioned before that there's some debate on this, but uh, some would point to Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 as uh, indicating uh, the fall of Satan. And I personally think that there's something to that. Um, As we talked about before, there ends up being human beings that are being directly addressed in those passages, but the descriptions that seem to be discussed in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 seem to go beyond just a mere uh, human uh, being. So I would take it that the fall of Satan has already occurred by that point, and I personally think those Ezekiel and Isaiah passages would be describing uh, what what took place there. So you have this being show show up, uh, but it's also important to remember, you know, as we'll see in Romans chapter 5 verse 12 that it's through the one man that sin and death entered the world. So even though Satan has fallen at this point, uh, the Bible is going to say that it's through the sin of the federal head, Adam, that we actually have sin and death enter uh, the world. But anyway, he comes on the scene here. There's the 
he, he immediately starts to place doubt with the woman, with Eve. Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. So this is the first recorded challenge of something that God has said. And so doubt is planted. Uh, verse two says, the woman said to the serpent from the fruit of the tree of the garden, trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. So the woman uh, states what God had originally told, uh, the first man had told Adam. Notice it says in verse two, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. So there's access to all the other trees. There's a little bit of uh, debate as to whether uh, Adam and Eve were actually participating in the tree of life at that particular point. There's some debate as to whether that was one of the trees they were eaten from or if that would have been a reward. The tree of life would have been a reward for passing the test. Uh, verse four, the serpent said to the woman, you surely shall not die for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil. So there's a claim here that God, God really God is a liar coming from the serpent that he's holding out on you, that he's, uh, there's something good beyond what God has told you. And I think I mentioned before that there really ends up being parallels with that and basically every sin that takes place after that. Uh, people deciding for themselves uh, what they think is best for them, ignoring what God has said, taking things into their own hands. And there's the desire to be like God. You will be like God knowing good and evil. And that knowing good and evil, I think, you know, has implications in regard to self-autonomy and making one's decisions for one's own self. And so there's a sense in which Adam and Eve will try to take that into their own hands. Verse six, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with, with her and he ate. So her focus goes off of what God said, focusing on the food of the tree and what that would mean for her. And so she takes it and she gives it to her husband. Um, Adam's shown great leadership here, goes along <laughs> with what he even said, just kidding on that, but he goes along with it. And then we see in verse seven, the eyes of both of them are open. They knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made, them so, made themselves uh, loin coverings. One of the things that we're gonna see involved with the, with the fall here is this uh, sense of shame. Uh, obviously, I think there's an immediate understanding that these great expectations of participating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil are not coming to fruition instead of this great uh, enlightenment and wonderful experience, there ends up being uh, shame involved. So, so they sin, they, uh, they disobey God. Like I said, from a real superficial standpoint, and, you know, taking a, a, a forbidden fruit to a lot of people may not seem like that big of a deal, um, but what's behind it is very significant. It was a specific command of God there was no doubt about what God had said, and they decide to follow their own way and to disobey God. And uh, so there, when you come to verse eight, this is where we see uh, the, the consequences. Uh, verse eight says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So it's interesting there, it appears to be leading up to this point that God's presence appears to be among them. Now, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Um, and then they hide themselves, uh, which appears to be that they're ashamed of what they've done. Verse nine says, then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And he said, who, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And this is then, then this is where you get the, the, uh, the blame going in this. Uh, everybody, we see the, uh, the roots of blaming somebody else for something that we've done wrong. Uh, verse 12, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. So basically it's her fault. She's the one that gave it to me. And then the, uh, Verse 13, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the finger goes from Adam to the woman to the serpent. And then in verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, and this is where we have the uh, 
you know, the consequences being given to the various parties involved with this here. Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. So there appears to be implications here for the, uh, the instrument being used in this encounter, which is for the serpent, which means on the belly eating dust all the days of its life. I do think though that when you get to verse 15, that this is gonna have implications for the power behind the serpent. <clears throat> uh, verse 15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So it appears to be, in other words, there's gonna be hostility, animosity, enmity between uh, the, uh, the serpent and the power behind the serpent and the woman and between your seed and her seed he, and I notice that it, it focuses into a he, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. So, oh, you know, we usually uh, look at this verse as in, indicating, and particularly as we know how the canonical revelation will unfold, that this is indicating some sort of a, a one in the many aspect to the, to the seed concept here. We're seeing here there's going to be a battle uh, between uh, your seed and her seed. It seems to involve a collective sense to it. Of course, at that particular time, it might be a little less clear as far as the overall collective sense of it because, you know, I think, as I told you before, I think when you get to Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, I think it's very possible that Eve may have thought that Cain would, would be the deliverer promised in uh, Genesis 3.15. But clearly, as Scripture unfolds, we, we see this one in the many aspect to it. But, you know, our our job right now is not to go, uh, Genesis 3.15 as far as the promise plan, we'll get a lot more specific into that when we get to the doctrine of soteriology and salvation, but I think it's important to understand here that uh, there ends up being a promise plan that's put into place almost immediately uh, after the fall. Uh, man deserves death, but we see from Genesis 3.15 that it's not God's plan to just extinguish and exterminate man at this particular point, because obviously if he would have, uh, man die spiritually and then the process of physical death is in play. Uh, but if he extinguishes man physically at this particular point, then there's, you know, the, uh, the Genesis 1, 26 to 28 kingdom mandate will never be fulfilled. So this does indicate hope uh, within the, the midst of all the serious consequences that are taking place here. Um, when we talk about he shall bruise you on the head, that appears to be a victorious fatal blow, but it's also true that you shall bruise him on the heel, which means that in this cosmic battle, I mean, as we would look at this canonically, we would obviously see this having Im uh, implications in regard to the, uh, uh, to the cross of Christ, uh, to the uh, infliction of damage Satan would uh, inflict on him, but Christ also delivering a, a, uh, a crushing blow to him. Verse 16, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. So, Notice as we're, as we're going through here, we're seeing, we're seeing implications of the curse in the fallen world in regard to some of the responsibilities that were, had already been given. I mean, we already know from uh, Genesis 1 and 2, particularly Genesis uh, 1, 26 to 28 and verse 27 in particular, that it was God's plan for uh, mankind with the man and the woman to multiply and fill the earth. But at this particular point, there seems to be the, uh, the, and obviously the woman, by the way God has designed her, is going to be the direct vessel for the carrying out of the multiplication. So in the air, one of the areas that she's created for, which is to, you know, the bearing of children, we see that one of the implications now is that there's going to be pain in childbirth. So in pain, you shall bring forth children. Now, the next part of verse 16, there's some pretty healthy debate as to the implications of this. Uh, Yet your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And you know, there's a, a real strong split on this issue as to when it talks about your desire for, shall be for your husband, is that a reference to a physical desire that a woman would still have for her uh, husband? Uh, or is it a reference to uh, perhaps like a controlling desire? Perhaps now the, uh, um, you know, with uh, Eve taking the leadership 
in the, in the Genesis 3 fall and Adam going along with it, that this, in a sense, is you know, in, indicating that this uh, state of uh, man and uh, woman trying to usurp, usurp the authority of her husband. So I guess when it comes down to it, is this referring to physical desire that a woman would have or is this predicting the tension in the uh, relationship where the man is supposed to be the leader but the woman's desire is going to be to usurp his uh, authority? Um, for those that would argue for the former, that this is referring to uh, physical desire, you know, some have said, well, you know, that doesn't appear to be, you know, necessarily a, uh, uh, you know, a negative thing. But if you, if you look at it in its context, you could see how it could make sense. God is just stating here that there's going to be pain in childbirth. So the tendency may be for the woman to like, well, forget this. If there's going to be pain in childbirth, we'll just forget the, uh, the childbirth part of it. But so... If this interpretation is correct, then you know she's still going to have that desire, even though there's pain. She's still going to have the desire. Like I said, others have seen this as indicating tension within the relationship, and perhaps if that if that's the case, and I tend to lean towards that understanding. Uh, this is uh, if you put Genesis three together as a whole, you're seeing that uh, all three relationships that uh, God has put man in. Uh, man to God, man to others, and man to creation. Um, this perhaps would be an indicator of the, of the tension within the, 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 the human race. That even at the most uh, core human relationship, there's going to be a struggle, a struggle there. Verse 17, Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground. Let me make sure I get this. See if I can get a little bit more light here. Cursed is the ground because of you. Uh, let me see. So the Adam said, verse 17, But because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you shall eat the, the plants of the field. Uh, so notice there, we're seeing the cursed is the ground because of you. Now again, remember, going back to Genesis 1, we saw the beauties of the creation. Genesis 1.31 is declaring it to be very good. Uh, we know from uh, Genesis chapter 2 that Adam was placed in the garden to cultivate and to keep the garden. So, and we know from Genesis 1.26 to 28 that he's supposed to rule and subdue it. And so he's to be very active. Uh, but now we see that the, the very realm, again, remember that, I mean, the, 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 it, it's the land, it's the earth that Adam is to be controlling. Now we're going to see that it's going to bite back. <laughs> Those are my terms. The, uh, the ground that Adam is supposed to subdue, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to bite and snap back at him. In other words, it's going to be difficult. You know, in toil... You shall eat of it all the days of your life, which is predicting that it's it's going to be hard. And again, I think one one of the ma there there's several major implications of the fall, but one of the major implications of the fall is that because of man's sin, that the thing that he's created to do, which is to rule and subdue the earth for God's glory, he's it's it's going to be a, a consistent source of frustration for him, and he's not. He's not going to be able to be able to do it. And the history of mankind ever since that time has shown the, uh, the elusiveness of the creation when it comes to man being able to control it. I mean, even in spite of all of our technologies and great advances and this and that, we still see almost on a daily occurrence um, the earth <laughs> working against us. We particularly see that when we see natural disasters and those sorts of things. Uh, so... Um, and toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Verse 18, both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you. You shall eat the plants of the field. Uh, verse 19, by the sweat of your face, uh, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. So it seems to indicate the, uh, the, the, the difficulty of making a living and uh, basic provisions. It's going to be frustrating. And notice till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. So now that there's death has entered and um, you know, as I've looked at several books, sometimes people get into discussion, well, what kind of death occurred with Genesis three? Because we know that physical death didn't occur. 
You know, most of us would affirm that spiritual death occurred in the sense of being separated from God. Um, so, and some have said, well, therefore, just spiritual death is in play. Or actually, I th- actually think there's implications for both. I think there obviously is an immediate separation from God on the spiritual side. And even though man's not, his life is not snuffed out at that point, the, uh, the process of physical death is in play. That's why when you hit Genesis, well, first of all, you'll see it with uh, Abel when you're in Genesis 4, but when you're in Genesis 5 and you see the genealogies, it ends up in everybody dying. So I, I don't think it's right to just totally separate physical death uh, f- from the consequences here. But th- this, this concept is quite, I would call it tragically ironic. Remember that uh, Adam was formed from the dust of the ground. You know, God breathed in him the breath of life. He became a living being or a living soul. Now we're seeing here because of what has happened, he's going to return to the ground. So it, it's, it's almost like, again, I think of the uh, Adam is to rule and subdue the earth, but there's, there's a sense in which in the end, I don't mean the ultimate end, like an eschatological end, but in the end, this uh, ground and this earth that Adam is supposed to do, in the end, it swallows him up. I mean, it swallows up, up in death. And whenever there's a, a, a burial, you know, we put somebody back into the ground. It's almost like a, again, just a reminder <laughs> of the consequences of, of death. And in, in this particular age, it's, it's almost like the, uh, the earth is winning uh, the battle. Now, as I say that, I would reaffirm the truth of Romans 8, that the creation is also looking for glorification. It's groaning, longing for the day where we're glorified so it can be glorified. But there is a sense in which the, uh, the ground that we're supposed to subdue and rule over, it swallows us up. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. So, implications for the uh, the created order. So, end of verse 20, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So, verse 21, uh, where the Lord God made garments of skin, I mean, it seems to indicate that there may be animal death at this point. So, there may be the shedding of blood for a provision in some sense at this particular time. So some have wondered, is this kind of like a uh, kind of like a type or kind of like a typological indicator towards the necessity of sacrifices for the covering of sin? Um, I guess I'm okay with that. I don't like to push that too far, but I mean, I, I, you definitely, it's, it appears to be the case that there's uh, animals killed in a provisionary sense. If somebody wants to call that a, you know, a, perhaps a typological connection with further sacrifices, I guess I'm okay with that. So verse 22, the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, there, there's an interesting statement there about he's become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Um, I would tend to think that that probably has imp- implications for the, uh, the issue of autonomy when it comes to making decisions. I mean, in reality, only God is the one that truly has autonomy when it comes to, to decision making. The, the creature is supposed to make decisions in light of the creator. But Adam and Eve have stepped out of that, making an autonomous decision for themselves apart from God. So they have done that. They have experienced what it's like to be autonomous. But since they're creatures, they're going to have to suffer the consequences of what that is because that's not the way God made the universe to work where you can have uh, multiple autonomous beings doing their own thing. Um, We're the creature and we're supposed to serve him. So in light of that, uh, because behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out and at the east of the garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So it seems pretty important from verses 22 to 24 that man can't stay (laughs) in the garden and he can't have access to the tree of life. So there has to be an expulsion here. And this appears to me to be, and obviously as you're reading this, you're seeing this as a, there's a negative thing taking place. There's a judgment here. I mean, they're going to be barred access to the tree of life. They're going to be expelled from the garden. So certainly it's a judgment, but this may also be also in the long run, also a blessing because 
in verse 22, it says, he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So, you know, most who study that passage seem to think that that's indicating that if they were to eat of the tree of life, that they would remain confirmed in their fallen state and perhaps would be unsavable. So there obviously was, uh, God had good reasons for uh, them not participating of the tree of life. I mentioned before that you get into a little bit of uh, debate as to you know, whether they had eaten of the tree of life at all at this particular point. Or, you know, I, I, I guess if, if it ends up being the case that they had not been eating of the tree of life, it may be the case that the tree of life perhaps may have been some sort of reward for obeying the command of Genesis 2, 15 to 17. And so, and at that particular point, perhaps there's some confirmation within their, uh, you know, if they pass the test then there's confirmation within that state and perhaps there's um, a partic that particular point on they couldn't sin anymore. Um, others have taken the view that because they were able to eat of all the other trees at this particular point, that uh, perhaps the tree of life is God's ordained means of, of sustaining their immortality. And thus by barring them from the tree of life, it's that at that point that the process of death uh, slowly but surely kicks in. And almost be kind of like if, uh, you know, to use an imperfect analogy, just like if we, if all of a sudden a decision was made now that we were barred from food and water, we wouldn't die in 10 seconds, but that process would be in play. And so some would say that that part of the, uh, the sustaining of the mortality is that they were able to eat of the tree of life. And then the cutting off of it in a sense is the death sentence, because if you, if you were to, if you were to, to use the imperfect analogy again, bar somebody from having food, they eventually would die. Um, part of the reason I think why that's maybe possible is when you get to the, uh, when you get to Revelation 21 and 22, you actually see the tree of life appearing again and people are participating in it again. So, you know, some have said perhaps it's possible that even when you get into the new earth, participation in the tree of the tree of life continually is part of the reason why, um, you know, people will, will, will live, live forever and in a certain sense be uh, immortal. So, I guess that's an, that's an interest, uh, perhaps that's more of, a, it's an eschatological question, but it's also relevant for Genesis 1 to 2. I, I guess when it comes to God's plan for man to have life and even eternal life, is, is eternal life something, is it something that is zapped on you? In other words, I'm perhaps being a little funny with the terms, but like, you know, when you're glorified, is there kind of an inherent immortality or does God still intend for there to be participation I don't know if sacrament's the best word or whatever, but participation in the tree of life, which sustains, sustains life. So, but anyway, but coming back to verse 22, they definitely are not allowed to eat of the tree of life. And it appears to be because if they did, they would be in this, perhaps confirmed in the state that they're presently in. So they're, uh, they're driven out of the garden of course, one of the things what seems to be the case here is they're removed from the tree of life. They're removed from the blessings of the garden. It does appear to be the case that in verse eight, that uh, at least at some point, God was walking. The presence of God was with man at that particular time. One of the interesting things about Revelation 22 is you see that the full presence of the Godhead is with man when you get into the new Jerusalem, uh, which is on the, uh, the new earth. So... Maybe just to summarize some of the implications, I did a, this is be, this would be page 40, I'm sorry, page 63 and page 64. I'll try to summarize here the uh, implications of the fall of Genesis 3 on the following. Again, my understanding would be is that we have a, uh, a Satan inspired serpent. And so there's implications for both the serpent and Satan. The, uh, when it comes to the serpent, the serpent is cursed. So it seems to be the instrument through which Satan used is, uh, uh, there's implications for the serpent. I can't remember the exact passage, but I, I think there's a, a statement in Isaiah that even indicates that even, even when you get into the new earth, there's positive conditions. We're told that a, you know, that a child can play by a cobra's hole and nest, but they, they are still said to have to crawl on their belly even, in the, uh, even on the new earth. 
So, the, but the serpent is cursed. Life is to be lived on its belly. There's eating of dust. Uh, snakes vulnerable to crushing blow from men. When it comes to Satan, uh, really the prediction of, of defeat. There's going to be a seed of the woman that's going to give you a crushing fatal blow. So that's predicting victory over the serpent. When it comes to man and woman together, we could say that with uh, one of the implications is that they acted independently of God. There was self-autonomy. So that's, I think that ends up being the main sense in which they, <laughs> their being like God did occur. They stepped out and made an autonomous decision, which again is what all of us do whenever we sin, right? It's like, you know, we know God has said this, but we're going to do our own thing. So as I mentioned before, I think, I think every sin mirrors the first sin because it's like, I'm going to do what I want to do. So they have an experiential knowledge of evil at that particular point. There is fear. And, and not, notice when you, when you look at these other things here, it's, uh, I guess these are part of the unintended consequences of sin. Uh, you know, Satan through the serpents telling them you're going to be like God and they're expecting this... Uh, wonderful eureka moment of of transcendence beyond what they currently have but notice what they get they get fear they get shame uh, you see the uh, blaming of others and of course there's death spiritual death i think we talked about this last class but you know there's uh, there's spiritual death it means you're alienated from god there's physical death which obviously is the cessation of the of, of the body uh, the life of the body. And then there's eternal death, which if a person who is spiritually dead were to physically die, then there's eternal death that would follow after that. So the very fact that God did not snuff out mankind at this particular point indicates that there's hope. But they're sent out from the Garden of Eden and then they're expelled from access to the Tree of Life. So that's what happens to both of them together. When it comes to the woman, there's multiplied pain in childbirth, which again is a, uh, a negative element introduced into the original multiply and fulfill. So all her desire will be for her husband, but the husband will rule over the wife. When it comes to man, we also see a negative element introduced to what was originally something good. Man was originally to, to cultivate and keep the garden, rule and subdue the earth. Now we see that the creation will work against man. Uh, work will be hard. And then when it comes to the ground, uh, the ground is cursed. And with Genesis uh, 3.22, animals killed to provide a covering for Adam and Eve. All right, I'll open it up to any questions or thoughts that you guys have at this point. I'm curious about what, would, what was it like before the curse? So the What was what before the curse? Yeah, what was it like before the curse? So okay. Surely, they, they, the, the wife, I mean, the mother, I mean, Eve, was giving birth. Was good, you know, that was intended, right? Uh, but well, it was intended, but I would, I, when you get to Genesis 4, the first would be Cain. So right. there's not, yeah, but go ahead. Um, and so I was wondering, if, it, if, the, if, uh, the, if sin didn't come in, um, there was no pain. That was what the implication of this. Right. They would, be given, they would still be multiplying. Right. Um, I'm kind of looking at it more like God, God probably had plan A, maybe maybe no plan or plan B. But uh, I was thinking, I was just thinking, um, uh, Adam was already working, right? Uh, the Garden, uh, Garden of Eden, but because of sin, he has to toil, he has to suffer. So, so here, my question is, yeah. um, was there no suffering at all before the curse? There's no pain. It's kind of like heaven on earth. So. Yeah, I mean, I would say the, well, Romans 5.12, it's through, through the one man's sin comes and as, as a result of sin, death. So in that sense, the uh, death and the negative conditions, I think, are introduced at, uh, introduced at that point. So, so yeah, in other words, I, I would say before the fall that you're not having negative implications, just like you wouldn't have negative implications in the, in the eternal state. Now, one of the things I guess you have to look at is some people point out, well, whenever you eat fruit or whatever, there's a sense in which you're dealing with plant life and those sorts of things. And, you know, so in that sense, you know, there's, as we're participating in those things, there's a, 
obviously there's plant life that is being consumed by humans or whatever, but I think that even that is part of the original divine intent and the purpose of that. But if I'm understanding your question right, I would say, yeah, I would just say at, at that particular point, you don't, have hum, you don't have human death or animal death before that. And uh, it's, it's death and those things that, being, that bring the, uh, the pain and death and those sorts of things. Now, of course, that wouldn't be the case if you hold to a, any kind of uh, evolutionary theory or even theistic evolutionary theory. I mean, in that sense, you would be having death before the Adam and Eve encounter. But I don't know, does that answer your question? Quick question then. Yeah. Is the language, the tone that God uses here, it sounds like, what did you do to change my plan? So did you, do you believe that there was two plans, plan A and plan B? Or overall, God just had this plan that he would allow sin to happen in the world? Yeah. That's a, that's a more of a deeper philosophical question. I, I guess what I would say is I, I would affirm two things. One of them would be, I do believe that there's an eternal plan and an eternal decree. So in that sense, the, uh, I mean, even Ephesians 1, you know, it's talking about, you know, cho chosen in him before the foundation of the world, you know, those sorts of things. So in one sense, in one sense, there's not plan A and plan B from God's perspective, because I think there's an eternal plan with an eternal decree. On the other hand, affirming that, <laughs> because we are dealing, because being image bearers means volition, and volition means will, and will means decisions, and there's consequences for decisions. As, as man is created and time is playing out in history, there ends up being certain contingencies that God gives man that are still under his sovereignty, but does change the trajectory from the human standpoint of, of things. I think you'll see that all throughout scripture. I mean, there was a, I mean, when you're dealing with uh, Saul, when, when the kingdom is removed from Saul, God tells him that you're, your, 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 uh, your kingly line could have been established forever, but now it's being taken from you. Well, we, well, we know that never really could have happened because the, 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 the line is supposed to run through David, not through Saul. But still there was the, uh, the presentation of that truth and the, uh, from the human standpoint, the possibility of that occurring. So I, I guess if you look at Genesis 2:15 to 17, there's a, a true legitimate test that is giving to Adam that if he, if he fails it, there's these consequences which occurred, but if he succeeds in it, then the negative consequences don't occur. So I think God's aware of those contingencies and he actually pre predestined those to be a part of the plan. So I guess it's one of those issues where I think you have to, you have to affirm both. I think the ultimate catch all though is God's sovereignty and, and ultimately in the eternal counsels, there's not plan A and plan B. But I mean, like, I mean, this, like we, I mean, if you just want to take it on a real small level, we could, we could say there's a contingency element whenever we share the gospel with somebody. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. I mean, that's a legitimate offer of which in the moment there's a con contingency there. We can say if a person believes they have eternal life, but obviously in our, with our belief on God's sovereignty, even before time, you know, even the choice is involved. I mean, even the choice being made is part of the sovereignty of God. And so both are, both are true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just on that plan thing, when I see in Romans 9, you know, God, you know, what if God yeah. desiring to make known yeah. um, his mercy, you, you see in, you see in Romans 9 that, um, Sin is kind of a divine necessity. God already knows that sin is a divine necessity for Him to display some of His attributes. His attributes, right? And so, from the beginning, God, as I read it, God from the beginning desires to display attributes such as mercy, and sin would be necessary for God to display His mercy. Which so. is part of the apologetic for why that why the world is the way that it is. Yeah, and I think that's one of the answers, right? Yeah. Yeah, because he says that part of the reason he, he raised up Pharaoh is that certain attributes of his could be displayed. His power, his power could be displayed. So, I mean, if you look at, I mean, I, I think one example of contingency would be in, uh, oh, I may not have the right chapter. I may have to come back to it later. Let me just look at it real quick. The, uh, oh, I'll have to find a chapter. There's a, uh, Oh, the chapter I'll get back to you later where it's talking about if, an, if a nation decides to uh, 
if God says something about nation, but if they repent, then the uh, consequences will be different than the original prediction, but I'll have to find that later. All right. Any other questions on, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just had a question uh, just with regards to uh, 3 verse 22. Okay. And uh, the connection between that and 2 verse 17 it says in 2 17, the day you eat from it, you shall surely die. Mm-hmm. And then to, uh, 322, he's, he has, it seems to have this idea that there was also the tree of life was involved in keeping man alive. Yeah. And so I was just kind of wondering if there was a connection, you know, how those, those factors, the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life and the promise that you will surely die all mm-hmm. kind of work together. Yeah, so the three, the promise of you shall surely die with the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, I would say that the, uh, the statement in verse 17, you shall surely die. Uh, you know, some have said because the fact that they didn't die on the spot indicates that this just, just must be a reference to spiritual death. I think it doesn't, I, 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 w- I would still say at, three, at 217, I would still say that this includes the whole package of spiritual and physical death. So I would say that my understanding of that would be is that when they, because death has, death is death, but death also has multiple facets to it, that spiritual death occurs and the process of physical death at that point was unleashed. So I would include the, phys- I, I, would, I would say that the fact that there's a promise plan based on Genesis 3.15 indicates that it was not God's plan for there to be all the dimensions of death immediately take place. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't death that occurred because there was spiritual death and physical death is in play. So, and now I guess the next issue would be is how, how would I view like the, the tree of life at that point? Yeah, I mean, is, is the removal of the tree of life part of that curse? I would say, that goes a little back to what I was saying earlier, that I would say, um, y- yeah, that it's very possible, yes. The, if it were the case, we're not told whether they were partaking in the tree of life or not. But if they were, then clearly that would be part of the death sentence. Because if we talked about before that if, participation in the tree of life is what sustains a person to stay alive, then being cut off from that is part of a death sentence. Just like if I were to, if, 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 if somehow there could be a decision made, which obviously we wouldn't want, but if somebody were to declare, um, I sentence you to die and I have the authority for you not to partake of food anymore, that process would be in place. So that would be part of the, part of, part of the, death, the death sentence there. And then as far as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I mean, obviously, that's, that's, that's the test. So they participate that, which launches the death process. But go back. I want to make sure I'm hitting your question well, directly. Well, there seems to be almost two factors. Yeah. These two trees both seem to be playing a factor in keeping, sustaining them. Mm-hmm. One is their obedience by not taking the and not fruit. And that participation. And the other one life. is that other piece. And so I'm just wondering if both of those together are a necessary part of that death process by which... You know, you shall surely die because, okay, yeah. you're going to start by dis- disobeying, but on the yeah. other hand, the sustenance. Because obviously participation in the tree of life launches the death process. Removal, like I said, it, uh, uh, the, the other part of the tree of life, like I said, depends on whether they were participating in it or not already. If they weren't participating in it already, then it's possible it might be more of perhaps a reward for passing the test. Um, I probably, I, I mean, I might, I may... I actually lean a little more towards the view that they, they may have been participating in it already. And if that is the case, then it would be more directly related to the death, because being cut off from it would, in a sense, is a death sentence. They were, appear to be having the presence of, I mean, when you look at eschatology, and this is, this is part of where a truth of eschatology may help us understand a, a protology thing. When I, get to Genesis, when I get to Revelation 21 and 22, I see man's, I see God's presence fully among man and I see people particip- participating of the tree of life. So is it possible that those were the conditions before the fall? I mean, I think it is, but I'm not, I'm not dogmatic on that one because the scripture just doesn't flat say whether they were or weren't. All right, let's see, we'll go here and then Jason, go ahead. Um, so part of God's curse on the woman is that her desire will be for her husband and that he shall rule over her. Yeah. Am I reading too much of, into it to notice that God never said before the fall that Adam would rule over Eve? Is there anything there, or is that am I reading too much into that? Well, I still think that there would be authority. I mean, I, I I think this, if if it is the case that this is talking about tension within the relationship, the, the rule I think the rule over you statement, the immediate context is your desire shall be for your husband. In other words, if you're 
if your desire is to usurp his leadership, but he will rule over you, I think that's in the context more of, an, of, of a negative tension that wouldn't have been there before the fall. But I think there's, I mean, obviously this gets into the complementarian versus egalitarian issues. I, I, I would say Adam's being created first, a woman being cre- you know, taken out of, of the man, uh, the man's naming of Eve and those sorts of things is indicating leadership. And uh, I think there's statements and even in 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul goes back to the creation account and he's making functional distinctions between men and women. So I would say that there's evidence for functional distinction before the fall. But when you get to Genesis 3, uh, 16, that the main emphasis there is, is uh, tension within the human relationship. Jason, go ahead and then we'll come back. back yeah. Carol's question, just to 216 when... I was thinking about what you said about did they eat of it before the sin? Yeah. Is it too much to make an implication because the God says you can eat of every tree of the garden? Yeah. So we assume that the tree of life's in the garden. Yeah. I know it doesn't say. It doesn't that they say, but that's but yeah. So the implication there, can we say that? Could be that they were eating. They were eating of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of those that it's a it's a logical, perhaps even probable inference to come to that conclusion, but you have to stop short of saying for sure because it doesn't specifically say. But I I would tend to, you know, if I were making a case that they were participating in it, I would probably would, uh, that would probably be, that would be part of the argument and the conditions of Revelation 22. Yep, go ahead. Um, in Genesis 3.15, would you mind clarifying the difference between the battle of the two seeds versus the enmity between. Like what are the implications of the enmity between the woman and the serpent versus the two seeds? Okay. So let me just make sure I'm understanding you right. Because the, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. So you're asking me to comment on, say it again. Yeah, the, is there a difference between the enmity between the woman and the serpent yeah. and the two seeds? And um, are there implications? No, I, I think they're related. So, no, and, and I think that, I, again, I think this is one of those, uh, I, I think this is where you're seeing um, the one and the many playing against each other here, which you see throughout the rest of scripture in regard to the seed. So in other words, but, but um, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So there's, there in a sense, there is a, a, a federal, in, in a sense, headship implications there. I mean, obviously we're dealing with you, you know, the power, Satan, who's the power behind the serpent, and then the woman. And obviously we're dealing with representatives here. And obviously when you get to Romans 5, Adam is one who's declared to be the head of the, the human race. But when it gets to, be, be, when, it, when it introduced between your seed and her seed, it may not at this particular point be crystal clear that this indicates a big corporate aspect to it. But I think it's, uh, it's, it's certainly... As scripture plays out, we see that it certainly includes that idea. So, so I, I, this is the way I would look at it. When to, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. I think, I think we're, we're dealing with two individuals at this point. Then when it talks about between your seed and her seed, that broadens out to the corporate aspect. But then it goes back to the more of an individual when it says, uh, you shall bruise, um, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. I think from within that collective seed, there ends up becoming a, uh, almost a, a one versus one aspect again. I don't know if that's answering your question or not, but there, but I would see both. Okay, so it, it climaxes basically to the two seats. It's not necessary yeah. implications for today that there's enmity between woman, woman. Well, I would say that the battle is always going on. So, so in other words, I would I would see here that the uh, not 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 only is there uh, enmity between an, between serpents and humans, but I think this is also indicating a cosmic battle that even uh, that even takes the form of Cain and Abel that will take the form between any battle between good and evil throughout the whole scripture. As a matter of fact, Walter Kaiser makes the argument that the, you know, the uh, antichrist versus Christ in the end times is part of this. And then that's what come like from this point, what you'll see is because there is the promise of the seed of the woman, I actually, this is where I've made statements before that I believe there's a messianic hope here. Like in Genesis 4, 1, I have gotten a man even the Lord, now that's not what all the translations have, but that seems to be more the literal understanding. It's possible that uh, Eve may have thought Cain was the deliverer. I've told you my view that I think 
Noah's father thought he might have been the one to reverse the curse in Genesis 5, 20 to 29. So I think within the people of God, there's this expectation. And then when you look at it, you can see the seed line. Um, Adam, Seth, Noah, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David, Christ. So as time goes on, that seed it gets, it gets more narrow. You're getting more closer to the he. Which is really that, that con- the, the concept of the one and the many. Let me just put it this way. When you're studying Galatians 3, understanding Genesis 3.15 is crucial. Because the seed comes up. Because Jesus is going to be called the ultimate seed of Abraham in Genesis 3.16. And then you're going to end up seeing everybody who identifies with Christ is seed of Abraham in Galatians 3.29. So in one sense, in Galatians 3, you have the one, the he, Jesus, and then the many being the, uh, the corporate aspect. All right, did I see somebody else? Yep, go ahead. You talked about the irony of, of Adam uh, being swallowed up by the ground and turning to yeah. dust as part of the curse. And I was looking at it and I kind of want to get your take on, do you, do you see some irony as well between his resistance to God's authority and part of the curse being um, resistance to his authority in the mm-hmm. home with Eve and also the ground resisting him? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is a, uh, I, I, think that's, I think that's right. I mean, there is a sense in which, because I mean, cause, cause one of the things we know about creation is the creation is not God, but it mirrors things within the God. It just was in the Godhead. There's, there's unity and diversity, equality, but functional distinction. There is a sense it is ironic that within man, there's the unity of the male and female within the image of God, but different functions. In this particular case, you know, there's a, uh, obviously you don't have a rebellion within the members of, of, of the Trinity like you do with man. Um, but, there is, but there is a parallel in the uh, resisting of authority. So I think there could be something to that. In light of that, let's go to Romans chapter 5. And again, the reason why we're going to Romans 5 is whenever we, whenever we look at a category of systematic theology, we want to go to uh, the passages that appear to address assert that category most directly. Obviously, Genesis 3 is the most direct passage dealing with uh, sin and the fall. But Romans 5 is pretty significant too when it comes to discussing uh, theological implications of, of sin. Romans 5, 12 to 21 is a uh, very significant passage dealing with the issue of uh, sin, and, sin and salvation. It's one of these passages along with 1 Corinthians 15 that's making very explicit uh, theological connections between the first Adam and the last Adam. So Romans chapter 5, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, make, a, make a lot of uh, Adam and Jesus uh, parallels. Uh, Romans 5, 12 to 21 too is also one of the more disputed passages just because there's a lot of different views uh, on it. The, of course, one of the things to remember when you get to Romans 5 is where we've come from. M- most of you are probably familiar that in Romans 1 to 3, Paul is indicating that all of mankind is under sin. He made it very clear you know, that even Gentiles who do not specifically have the Mosaic law, there's a sense in which the works of the law and their conscience, or the works of the law on their heart and their conscience testify to them that they are sinners. So you can't, you can't come out of Romans uh, 1 and 2 without understanding that Gentiles are, are, are sinners. And then after that, you know, in, in chapter 2, verse 17, if you bear the name Jew, he obviously goes on to show Jews have the Mosaic law. And because they actually have written commands, their, their sin is especially evident because they're violating specific commands that have been written down. Uh, So Romans 1 to 3, all of mankind, sinners, Gentiles and Jews. Romans chapter 4 is very important because it talks about the salvation is through faith alone. The uh, examples of Abraham and David show that salvation is not based on works, that justification comes through faith. Uh, 
Paul even appealed to uh, Genesis 15, 6, where Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So even before the Mosaic law is on the scene, hundreds of years before, the paradigm of salvation is already there, which is faith, which should do away, which is part of Paul's argument as to why the Jews who are trying to obtain righteousness by keeping the Mosaic law, why it's, it's a failure because it already been established way before the Mosaic law that salvation was based through faith, not law keeping. So Romans chapter five, the first 11 verses is dealing with, you know, justification through faith as well. And then when you hit verse 12, uh, you have this discussion of sin and death's relationship to Adam and then what Christ brings to the table. So Romans chapter five, verse 12, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered into the world. It's pretty clear contextually that that one man is Adam. So we're told here through one man, sin entered the world. Now think about it. We believe that Satan showed up in Genesis chapter three, verse one as a fallen being. So in a sense, there had been in the cosmos, there had been sin. Um, and we also know that when it came to the actual timing of it, Eve actually partook of the fruit before Adam did. But notice who's, who's the one that gets the blame. It's, uh, it's the one man. And the reason why is because the, the one man is acting uh, as the head of the human race. And I think that's pretty clear from Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 that there's, you know, there is the concept of federal headship. There's, there's the concept of uh, representatives of mankind making decisions that uh, impact the rest of mankind. So, so just as through one man, sin entered into the world. Now at that particular point, that's pretty easy to follow because of Adam's sin. You know, that's how sin came into the world. Next part is also pretty easy to grasp and death through sin. So that's telling us there the reason that why we have death is because of sin, which seems to indicate that if there wasn't sin, there wouldn't be death. So Adam brings sin and because sin is in the world, there's also death. Now, it's the last part of verse 12 where there's incredible debate and back and forth. So death spread to all men because all sinned. Okay. Now, even on, even on the part here, death spread to all men, even that is pretty straightforward. That obviously there's, you know, death infects everyone except with the very, very rare exceptions of those who've already been raptured <laughs> up into heaven like Elijah. Um, death clearly is part of all mankind. So death spread to all men, but when it comes to the uh, because all sinned, that's where there ends up being uh, a lot of debate as to, you know, what, what, in what sense have all sinned? <laughs> so... You know, one of the views is going to be, well, death happens to everybody because everybody sins. In other words, every individual experiences death because every individual sins. As you read the whole passage, although that is theologically true, that doesn't seem to be the main point that Paul is making in Romans 5, 12 to 21. So and then when you, then with some of the other views, when you get into because all sinned, like I said, I'm sure, I think uh, Kent may have covered some of this with you. You, you get into different views of uh, uh, what does it mean that all sinned? I mean, I mean one, of the view, one, one of the views, which would be called the, uh, the seminal view, or I guess, I guess if you're looking in your notes, I guess I can point you to some of these here. The, uh, the Augustinian seminal view, which is talked about in ver on page 69. Um, some would say that all sinned in the sense that all humanity was actually present in seed form when Adam sinned. Thus, it can be said that we literally sinned when Adam sinned. So, uh, some would say that death spread to all men because all sin. Some would say, well, what's being talked about there is because Adam's the, the head of the human race, all of us were in him in seed form. Therefore, when he sinned, all of us participated in the sin. So, it gives it, gives it a little bit more of a uh, direct nature of our connection with, with death. Because sometimes people will say, wow, why did, you know, we just kind of, 
speaking to a, sometimes a general impression, like sure wish Adam didn't sin. He sure messed it up for all of us. You know, I, I'm not the reason why there's death in, in the world, but Adam is the reason. If, if you hold to a seminal view, you're, you're actually everybody was there affirming Adam's sin. All of humankind collectively was there and in a sense participating in it. The, another view would be, you know, the federal view, which would be, and this is page 68. I know I'm going a little bit out of order in your notes. But on page 68, uh, the federal view would be the view that Adam acted on behalf of the entire human race when he sinned. Much like the actions of a head of state affect an entire country, whether they want them to or not, Adam represented all of us when he chose to disobey God. So thus, um, that would be the statement that the, the representative of the human race plunged mankind into sin. And you know, that's not just an archaic understanding. I mean, we ha whenever a leader of a country makes a decision on behalf of a country, that's a federal decision. If a king or a president says this country's at war, guess what? You're, you're at war whether you like it or not. Uh, the enemy doesn't make uh, distinctions and say, that's, that's Joe Smith there. He doesn't like the war. I'm going to go over his house. I mean, you're, 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 you're part of that decision. Yep, go ahead. Is the major bone of contention between seminal and federal, is that the imputation of Adam's sin? Would that be the... Well, they, they both affirm, would have, they, they would both be forms. Re, 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 yeah, let's see, as far as the, the action of one being credited to another. I mean, traditionally, both have been understood within the concept of, of uh, imp, imp, imputation. I mean, it would seem to me that the federal might perhaps even more specifically be connected with that, but they both have been understood as forms of it. Why would, why would someone, um, say, take exception to the seminal view? What, what, what would be, what's, what's the issue that really matters in the eyes of the, the critics? Of critics of it? Well, I would say that the critics of it don't necessarily deny the concept. As a matter of fact, he, he, um, Hebrews 7 seems to have, seems to have the, uh, all right, here, let me give you a short answer before I give you a longer answer. I think the short answer is, is it's not so much a problem with the concept as it is that's not Paul's main point in Romans 5. And it's not a denial that you might find seminal implications in other passages. The key is what does he mean by here in Romans 5? Does he mean seminal? So you could actually believe in the, in the concept of the, of the seminal representation, but say that's not Paul's point in Romans 5. I mean, I, th I think it's... Uh, Hebrews 7, 9 to 10, where you do see a seminal concept. The, and if, you're, if you read Hokema's book, he, he ends up arguing for both. He, he ends up saying it's both federal and seminal. Um, if you look at the uh, Romans 7, 9 to 10, it says, uh, this is in regard to Melchizedek, whom Abraham came across. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, it's interesting about Hebrews. Hebrews is indicating the superiority of Christ's priesthood over the Levitical priesthood. And Christ's priesthood is said to be in the order of Melchizedek. So it's interesting here is you're seeing a tip of the hat, cultural expression here, from Levi, who's not even born, <laughs> but he's in the loins of Abraham, an ancestor that when he comes across Melchizedek, there's a sense in which, you know, Levi is said to, uh, you know, and so to speak, uh, through Abraham, even Levi who received tithes paid tithes for he was still in the loins of his father. So there's a sense in which even uh, Levi, the head of the Levitical priesthood is tipping his hat to Melchizedek and the implications of his priesthood. So that's clearly a seminal understanding right there. I don't see such a crucial difference between them, and yet I hear sometimes federal headship guys um, really down on the seminal view. Yeah. And I was just wondering, just trying to figure, what 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 is the issue that they take exception with? What what is the what is the beef that yeah. they have with? <clears throat> I can't speak for all of them. I'm just saying for m most of my experience, it, it, to me, it, it, it's been more in the realm of not so much antagonism to the concept, because most of them, I think you admitted Hebrews 7 teaches that concept, but more of what's the point of Romans 5. Yeah. Okay. Yep. 
In light of Romans 5, do you think that it has more to do with the issue of every man is responsible for his own sin? Um, if you take the sin of you, me, yeah. does it take some of that away? Or well, the sin that one of one of the uh, theological potential theological positives of the seminal view in Romans 5 is that alleviates a little bit of the tension of people being held responsible for things they didn't do. Like a lot of people struggle with the concept of federal headship because they don't think it's right that a person should have consequences based on what someone else has done. But if, you, if, a, if a seminal view is correct, there's a sense in which all of this participated in Adam's sin directly. So that's... That's some of the that, that's some of the issue there. Um, like I said, Hokema actually argues that there's uh, uh, implications for for both, and even I think even links the seminal aspect towards uh, um, the uh, inherited sin nature. I mean, because when, when you're dealing with the sin issue, you're you're I mean, there's three ways in which we're sinners. One of them would be by imputation. In other words, Adam's sin imputed to us. Adam's sin is imputed to us, to to all. Then there's another way, which is called inherited sin. Which is uh, all, you know, all inherit a sinful nature. Then of course there's number three, which is that we all commit um, commit acts of sin. So these this, these are the three ways. You know we are sinners. I mean the. Well, first of all, you know, I think every, everybody's going to admit we commit acts of sin. Then when it comes to inheritance sin, unless you're a Pelagian, everybody's going to admit that, there, that people are born with a sinful nature. When you get to the doctrine of imputation, I think, I think you're seeing it in Romans 5. Some people deny the concept almost altogether. Uh, but when you come to Romans 5, some will say, when it talks about because all sinned, some will say it's just acts of sin. Others will say it's in reference to inherited sin. And then others will say it's in regard to imputation. And then if you get in regard to imputation, some will say that it's a uh, federal or seminal or both. This would be within the, uh, the imputation. So, so it's, I mean, it's good just to think about this just in of itself. You say, okay, you know, mankind is a sinner. How is he a sinner? I think we're all going to agree unless, you know, like I said, unless you're, uh, you know, have a hold a liberal view or whatever, a super high view of man that we all commit acts of sin. Most are going to acknowledge that we have inherited sin. When it gets to the other one, it's a little bit more uh, controversial, but I find it to be thoroughly biblical that there's, there's imputation. Adam's sin in, Reckon to us, our sin reckoned to Christ as he dies on the cross, Christ's righteousness imputed to us. So I think you find the concept of imputation where something that belongs to one being given to another. I think that's a very scriptural concept. And then when you get to the imputation, is it because of uh, Adam acting as federal head of the race or is it seminal in the sense that we're all in him in seed form or is it both? All right, so coming back to Romans, Romans 5. I think, I think one of the key, this is how I try to approach the Romans 5. When I look at my whole Bible, I see all of these. <laughs> I, see, I see them all. Um, when it comes to Romans 5, it's another issue trying to decide what, it, what is Paul focusing on at that point. And so I, I personally think that the emphasis in Romans 5 is going to be imputation from a federal standpoint. I think that's the primary point of Romans 5. Go ahead. 
the difference between one and two. So yeah. I'll remove from Romans five is number one. Right. So for number two, I guess I've always thought there seems to be just an overlap there with one and two. Like uh, an overlap between the seminal view and the inherited. No, no, yeah, just the imputation and an inherited because you have it as two different. Yeah. So where would you? So Romans five is where number one is, right? Right. And number two. What are we thinking of with number two in terms of as a book? Because to me, I guess I look, yeah. I think of Romans five when I think that we've inherited. Yeah, something. are there the other passages that were by nature children of wrath, conceived in iniquity? I mean, I think there's other other passages where that's that's going to be that's going to be uh, emphasized. Um, then obviously this will be. I mean, that ends up being true from a lot of passages. All right. Let's. You know, let's just do this. The let's let's just go through Romans five and kind of bring up the issues. Like like I said, there's. I think it's helpful to understand that an idea can be theologically true, but that not may not be the emphasis of a writer in a certain passage. So. Anyway, so we're told in verse twelve that death spread to all men because all sinned. So we're, we're trying to answer the question of what does it mean that all sinned? Is that just acts of sin? Does that mean we all sinned because we were in Adam and seed form? Or we, are we all, did we all sin because of what Adam did? I think one of the reasons why the federal view is going to have a strong case in Romans 5 is because we're given parallels of what Christ has done on our behalf. So you're actually able to make comparisons between a federal and a seminal view by comparing it with Jesus who's paralleled with Adam in this passage. Now, one thing to understand here is when, when you, we were told this incredible statement that death spread to all men because all sinned. When you hit verse 13, I don't know if digression is the right thing here, but Paul gives, he starts to go into a discussion of um, the imputation of sin before the law. The only point that I'm going to make here is it, 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 it appears to be that when you get to verses 18 and 19, that's where the continuity again really picks up with the end of verse 12. So what, what, what takes place in verses 13 to 17 is a little bit parenthetical, obviously inspired, obviously equally important, but he digresses a little bit. You know, he says in verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world. So now he's making distinctions here between Adam and the time of the Mosaic law, which is a pretty big gap of time, right? For until the law, sin was in the world. So there's no doubt people are sinners, he makes that clear in Romans 1 to 3, right? Everybody's a sinner. Even, even the uh, Romans 2, 14 to 15, even those who don't have the Mosaic law, they, you know, they have the work of the law written on their hearts. We know people sin before the law. We know that Cain was a murderer, you know. So there's sin that's going on. But when he says, but sin is not imputed when there is no law, he seems to, and this is where it, 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 it can be a little bit confusing at first glance. Um, it almost makes it sound like he's making a statement now that you really don't have sin until the Mosaic law. I don't think that's what he's saying. I, I think what he's going to emphasize at this point here is that there does appear to be something particularly significant about having a written command that is violated. It's not, he's not going to be saying here, nobody sinned before the Mosaic law. But when the Mosaic law comes, there's actually a transgression in the sense that there's a written law that is being violated. So... Verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So we're told here, death reigns from Adam until Moses. That would be the era between the specific command given to Adam and the specific commands of Moses. It reigns, why? Because people are still dying. Read Genesis 5 even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam. Well, what, what's the offense of Adam? Adam had specific command, right? Genesis 2, 15 to 17 was special revelation. 
don't do this. <laughs> and then the next time that you get those sort of specific commands is obviously going to be with the Mosaic, the Mosaic law. So death reigns from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. And I think the reason for that, when you get to verses 18 and 19, is going to be because Adam did something that affected all of mankind. Verse 15, but the free, the free gift is not like the transgression. This is where you get Jesus, the other federal head. For if by the transgression of the one, the many died, and that's obviously a reference to Adam, right? If by the transgression of the one, when Adam sinned, the many died, and I think in this case, many's, it, it's not limiting, but it, it's including mankind. Much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. So think at this particular point, Adam does something that affects mankind. Jesus does something that affects mankind. Verse 16, though the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. So what Jesus does with his gift is not like what Adam did. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. So Adam, he does sin, which what results in condemnation for the many. Jesus does something, this gift that results in justification. Verse 17, for if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So then, and as I mentioned before, this is where I think the, uh, the direct pickup from the end of verse 12 takes place. <clears throat> so then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. So I think this is helping explain the end of Romans 5.12. Through one transgression... Adam's sin, the partaking of the fruit. What happened? There resulted condemnation to all men. Adam does something that affects all mankind. Now, we already said, okay, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that all of us were in Adam sinning, or does it mean that Adam is our federal head and he, he did something that impacted all of us, kind of like a, a head of state may do something that affects a whole country? Well, I think when you get to the comparison with Christ, it leans more towards the federal view than the seminal view. Because we're told, even so, through one act of righteousness, and I would say that's the cross, and just as, I mean, the emphasis seems to be on the specific acts. Adam partakes of the, tr of, of, of the fruit, condemnation. Jesus, obviously his whole life is righteous, but it culminates in the death of the cross through his, his death there. Through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. So Jesus brings justification to all men. Now, at this particular point, you, we can ask the question, how does the federal and the seminal work in relation to Christ? Are we all in seed form in Jesus when he does his one act? That doesn't seem to me to be the case. I, I, in other words, I would say that him, act, <clears throat> him acting on behalf of mankind in a federal way is more likely than it being seminal. That's what come I lean more towards a federal view than a seminal view in Romans 5. I'm not denying the seminal concept altogether. It just seems to be that Paul is emphasizing the federal headship here. <clears throat> so Christ brings justification of life to all men. Now somebody at this point may say, well, does that mean universalism? I think Karl Barth used this to say this is universalism. I would say no, because there's, we are told in verse 17, in the middle of the verse, that it's much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So we're seeing that the, uh, the subjective aspect of it is that those who receive the abundance of grace. So you got to remember that Karl Barth and others, Romans 5, for those who are supposedly Christian but universalist, Romans 5 is their main passage. And you can see why. You can see the, their argument. They, they say, let's just look at Adam. Adam, he did one act on behalf of man, and guess what? Everybody's lost. So when you come to Jesus, he does one act of righteousness. Guess what? Everybody's saved. 
Well, first of all, that violates all the other passages of scripture that talk about that everybody's not saved. But I would even say even in the middle of 517, we, we see a little bit of uh, a little bit of a, a little, what do you call it? A, a little bit of an asymmetrical relationship here because it's those who receive the abundance of grace will have eternal life. In the case of Adam, it just flat out goes to every, everybody. In this particular case, Christ does something, but it's for those who receive it. So you, I don't, you can't argue universalism from Romans 5. Now, m- moving on to verse 19. For as through the one man's disobedience, i.e. Adam's sin in the garden, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, Jesus with his death on the cross, the many will be made righteous. So again, I think that's affirmed. Uh, one act with a federal head doing something with implications for mankind. Verse 20, the law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, which again goes to that idea that law is a revealer of sin. Verse 21, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So just to summarize, I as I told you before, I believe in all of these up here. <laughs> I believe we're, there's passages that talk about our inherited sin, that we commit acts of sin. We saw seminal implications in Hebrews 7. But when I read Romans 5, I think the emphasis is on federal headship that he's talking about there because I think verses 18 and 19 best explain the end of verse 12. <clears throat> Messages is, uh, is it wrong if you say that there is a passage that uh, teaches these others? These others. No, you wouldn't be wrong. You just, like I said, the canon is bigger than just Romans five, but it seems like the emphasis of Romans five is uh, is on the uh, federal because when you make the parallel with Christ, the seminal doesn't seem to fit with the Christ parallel seems better to fit with the federal, which, and again, if you just look throughout the Bible, you see, now again, other, other verses doesn't necessarily make this particular verse the same thing, but you see federal headship all over the Bible. You see, you see heads of families making decisions for their families. You see heads of people groups making decisions that affect their people groups. You know, that's a, I mean, the con, I mean, to me, and, and like I said, it's, it's all over the Bible. And I, I would even say even up until this day, oftentimes you see federal implications for heads of families and people groups and that sort of thing. What I'm trying to understand, so we are not bound to one and only uh, position. Like we don't have to, uh, yeah. I'm, I believe in federal, I wish yeah. so we, I just say, can you affirm these others? Yes. Yeah. Right, yeah. And some have even postulated that, like M- Millard Erickson is, in his systematic theology has, has postulated this. Um, I mean, he, he has argued that whenever, whenever when, when a person commits an act of sin, there's a sense in which they're really, <laughs> they're really affirming. It, it's almost kind of like it's even ratifying the federal headship decision that was made. So in other words, you, you when, Adam's decision affects all of us, but when we choose to sin, there's a, sex, there's a, a, a sense in which we say, yes, Adam's, we, I'm, I'm owning that personally for myself now. I may be going, I'm not, I'm not sure that's exactly what Romans 5 is saying, but there, and certainly we would argue for an inherited sin as being part of it too. As a matter of fact, I think Hokema argues for the combination of those uh, imputations, seminal and inherited sin from Romans 5. <clears throat> Going back to the end of uh, verse 13 when Paul says, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Um, you had mentioned that we should not take this to, uh, to, to tie into the Mosaic Covenant, that uh, sin was not imputed because the Mosaic Covenant wasn't there. So is, it, is this appealing just to the conscience that, uh, you, that the fact that death uh, spread in, in verse 14 shows that, you know, that there, there was a law always in place that, that was really in our hearts through the conscience, and that's why death spread? Yeah. And I would say that that's, the, that's theologically true and even true from Romans 2, but it, it, I would even say that it's more linked to Adam's federal decision. In other words, that's why 
Yeah. Yeah. Because if the federal headship's view is true, then that would be, that that's part of the reason why people are, the main reason why people are dying, even though you don't, they don't have the Mosaic law yet. Now, some people would say, okay, does that mean that people are dying without any accountability for personal sin? I'd say no. <laughs> but the emphasis in the passage is the reason why they're dying is because of their relationship to Adam. That's more of the emphasis than their personal of whatever law existed, if it's um, because he was our federal head, he disobeyed. I think that's the main yeah. point, yeah. And like I said, the this is a come, I've said this over and over again, that there's a affirming what Romans 5 specifically saying is not a denial of the other scriptures that would indicate these other things. But you have to ask yourself, what is, what's the point here? And it seems to be he's linking people's deaths with what Adam did. Right, any other thoughts on Romans 5? You know, yeah, go ahead. I, I think I, I see from what you're saying that there's the, um, the imputation sort of equation. You know, you've got the imputation of um, Adam's sin to us, the imputation of our sin to Christ, and the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. Right. And so um, I can see that a denial of federal headship would do does violence to that equation. It sort of disrupts the whole thing. Um, yeah. I, guess, I guess that would be a problem. That would be the problem. Yeah. That in other words, yeah. So if you're thinking of the ripple effect in a pond, throwing a rock in a pond, that would be a denial there as it goes out. It may, it may be right. And of course, one of the one of the things we see with new perspectives is denial of imputation, on several levels. Yeah. So, and I would just say, I, I would say too, the, you know, I mentioned 1 Corinthians 15. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time there. But if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, you see uh, connections, strong connections between Adam and Christ. Let's see. Um, like, like let, let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. Let's start in verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. So there's a connection here between the mortal body and then the, uh, the physical immortal body. Uh, 43, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And again, I told you this before. I don't think spiritual means ghostly. It just means it sources from heaven. So it's, it's a, a spiritual body it can also be a physical body, but it's source, it's glorification. Um, if there is also a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also as it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So notice the federal, there's connections here between Adam and Jesus. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. Verse 47, the first man is from the earth. The second man is from heaven. And I notice, in, I, I, I should have mentioned this in verse 45, Jesus is specifically called the last Adam. So I think one of the interesting implications about this passage too is it, it may indicate that there may be eschatology in Genesis 1 and 2, where it's making the connection of the Adam's situation um, compared with, uh, uh, compared with uh, Christ. So I posited the possibility that there was a, you know, if there was a uh, successful completion of the dominion mandate of Genesis 1, 26 to 28, that may have, that may have uh, led toward to the eternal state with the presence of, where you don't have the presence of the, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then being confirmed in the state where sin would not uh, take place at all. That's another issue. But anyway, the, uh, put those together, the uh, Christ Adam parallels with I think federal headship implications are pretty significant. Yep. There's the, there's the first yeah. and there's the last. And what makes them Adam's, that designation, is the federal headship. The federal headship, yeah. Some want to put Noah in there. I mean, some, have, uh, some will refer to Noah as second Adam and Christ as last Adam. I am, I de there's definitely parallels between Noah and Adam all over the place. I'm a little reluctant to put that title for sure on Noah. But, but yeah, the, uh, I would affirm what you, what you uh, just said in that. that they're... Uh, 
two representatives of, of uh, hu- humankind. All right, any other thoughts? That's the real racial problem right there. The real what problem? That's the real racial problem right racial there. Racial problem. Is uh, um, the two races. You know, we, we hear a lot of talk about racism today, but that's the real racial problem right there. Yeah. Those who are in Adam, those who are in Yeah, those are in Adam versus those who are in Christ, yeah. And obviously you get into, federal headship is also gonna deal with identification issues. For those who are not in Christ, they're obviously identified with Adam and those who are in Christ. And that's where, you, that's where union with Christ obviously come into play. Um, who are those who are going to be uh, united with Christ are going to experience all the blessings of the of the last Adam, including glorification um, of the body, which is discussed in First Corinthians fifteen. Well, in the passage we looked at, but also First Corinthians fifteen twenty to twenty four. Any other? Yeah, sure. So the um, the seed of the woman, the seed of Eve, um, is looking forward to, to really that promised seed throughout the. Old Testament realized through <coughs> Jesus Christ and all of us who are born again. Yeah, right. So, but but um, so, so we we Jesus Christ becomes our federal head, and right. we are regenerated. So then, at, at that point, it almost seems like uh, I, I'm trying to make a distinction here. There's the seed of the woman, which uh, points to those who would be in Jesus Christ as a federal head, and then the seed of Satan, or the seed of the serpent, really is all those who are after Adam. Yeah. So that's how come you can say that battle. Not only did it start out in one versus one, but it continues out collectively throughout all of human history. Whenever there's a battle between good and evil, and then obviously it culminates with Jesus as the ultimate seed. We obviously know that Satan is obviously going to have his Antichrist figure. So, so even when you come to the end, it, it ends up be, being down to two two figures. That's come. It's interesting to see how the one and the many play off of each other. I mean, even like, even if you look at it like a uh, um, Adam. And Eve, and then you have, end up having uh, Noah, and then gets down to Abraham. But then when it Abraham, when you get Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then it multiplies into the nation of Israel. So it goes wide again. But then it narrows down. Line of Judah, line of David, culminates in Christ. But then according to Galatians three, everyone who believes in Christ is seed of Abraham, which has implications for the seed of the woman. And then uh, so you see that one in the many playing against each other in a good way.